We tend to think of TV and film productions as enjoying bottomless budgets, but that just isn't the case. Whether they were greedy, actually deserved more money, or were trying to get out of a role, these actors asked for a raise and found themselves fired. For three years, the teen comedy Lizzie McGuire ruled the Disney Channel roost with Hilary Duff in the titular role. Unfortunately, the success of 2003's The Lizzie McGuire Movie marked the beginning of the end for the fictional teen sweetheart. That same year, Entertainment Weekly spoke to Susan Duff, Hilary Duff's mother and manager. She said that Disney ended negotiations for a film sequel when she asked for a promised bonus to be paid immediately. She also told EW that Disney was trying to shortchange her daughter to continue on the Lizzie McGuire series. Apparently, they offered only $35,000 per episode, even though they knew she was being offered six figures by outside parties. In the end, it seems that Disney couldn't give her what she wanted, as both the TV series and the plans for a movie sequel ended. That's okay. I don't want it. In 2019, news broke that a revival series was being planned for Disney+, Plus, with Duff back in McGuire's shoes. But by the end of 2020, Duff told fans on her Instagram that the planned series wouldn't happen. In 1985's Back to the Future, Crispin Glover played Marty McFly's dad, George McFly. However, the star was not only absent for 1989's Back to the Future Part II and its sequel, except for shots recycled from the first film, but his disappearance indirectly led to a lawsuit. Glover was apparently unhappy with the script for Back to the Future 2 and demanded the same salary as lead Michael J. Fox, $1 million, to return. In 2012, Glover told the AV Club that this was a lie and that he was offered $150,000 for the sequel. He claimed that it was around half the amount offered to Leah Thompson and Tom Wilson, who had similar sized roles. He also said that when he tried to negotiate, the offer was actually decreased by $25,000. The following year on Opie and Anthony, Glover said he did express issues with the script and implied that the studio's supposedly low offer was punishment for his questions. With Glover out, Jeffrey Weissman stepped into the role and he was outfitted with a mold made from Glover's face. The mold turned out to be much more expensive than the filmmakers expected. In 1990, Glover sued the producers of Back to the Future Part II for using his likeness without permission. The producers settled for a reported $760,000. In 1988's Die Hard and its 1990 sequel, Bruce Willis's John McClane takes out the bad guys pretty much on his own. But in 1995's Die Hard with a Vengeance, he gets a sidekick in the form of electrician Zeus Carver. In a 2020 episode of the Rewatchables podcast, Quentin Tarantino said the part of Carver was written specifically with Lawrence Fishburne in mind. He added that Fishburne, believing he had the producers over the proverbial barrel, demanded a $1 million payday. But then came the 1994 Cannes Film Festival, where one of the producers was impressed with Samuel L. Jackson's performance in Pulp Fiction. As anyone who's seen Die Hard with a Vengeance knows, Jackson took the part of Carver and the producers escaped Fishburne's barrel. Or so they thought. In July 1994, before Die Hard with a Vengeance made its way to theaters, Fishburne hit the production company with a lawsuit for breach of contract. The lawsuit was settled three years later for $750,000, a couple bucks shy of what Fishburne would have gotten if the producers had agreed to his initial asking price. The action star clown car that is the Expendables franchise boasts names like Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jet Li, Terry Crews, Jason Statham, and many more. Of course, starting with 1988's Die Hard, Bruce Willis entered the pantheon of cinematic action heroes. Fittingly, Willis enjoys a cameo in 2010's The Expendables, along with a larger role in the 2012 sequel, The Expendables 2. But while most fans expected Willis to reprise the role of Church for 2014's The Expendables 3, it wasn't to be. In August 2013, Sylvester Stallone announced in all caps a major cast change on Twitter, sharing, Willis out, Harrison Ford in. Great news, been waiting years for this. By the following day, The Hollywood Reporter was claiming Willis's exit from the franchise was due to a huge paycheck demand. According to the source cited, Willis was offered $3 million for four days' work. He allegedly demanded a pay bump to $4 million, $1 million per day. The source added that Ford was cast within 72 hours of Willis's exit. To this day, plenty of fans named the late Sir Sean Connery as their favorite actor who played the sexy spy James Bond. However, the producers who negotiated with Connery may have felt differently. Connery's first turn as 007 came with 1962's Dr. No, and he played the charming secret agent in four more feature films before demanding a lot more compensation. 
By the time Connery starred in 1967's You Only Live Twice, he was being paid $750,000 plus a 25% share of merchandising. However, apparently, the actor was reportedly bored with playing the super spy and demanded $1 million to appear in the next Bond film, plus a percentage of the gross. Producers tried to use George Lazenby as a bargaining chip, but Connery didn't budge. And so the producers said goodbye to Connery, and Lazenby made his one and only appearance as James Bond in 1969's On Her Majesty's Secret Service. According to the documentary Becoming Bond, in spite of negative reviews for Lazenby's only Bond film, the actor said he was offered a contract for six more movies. He apparently turned them down on his agent's advice. Without Lazenby, United Artists lured Connery back to the world of espionage with a $1.25 million offer for 1971's Diamonds Are Forever. Since the early second season of the hit zombie apocalypse drama The Walking Dead, Maggie Ree, played by Lauren Cohan, was a staple of the series. However, in Season 9, Maggie left with the relative safety of the Hilltop Colony to join up with a different band of survivors. At least, that was the narrative reason for her absence. Behind the scenes, however, Cohan's contract renegotiations for Season 9 hadn't gone the way she'd hoped. Cohan refused to settle for less, and she was written out of the show. All this time running from walkers. You forget what people do. Cohan went on to star in the ABC action dramedy Whiskey Cavalier. According to Cohan, in spite of early reports that her only concern was money, she already had one foot out the door before contract negotiations broke down. In a 2018 discussion with Andy Cohen on Radio Andy, Cohan said she'd already been looking to explore, quote, comedy and happier fare. Talking to EW, Cohan mused, eight years is a long time to spend in one character. Thankfully for Maggie fans, the character was written off but not killed. And in October 2019, news broke that Cohan would be returning to The Walking Dead as a series regular for the 11th and final season. In fact, Cohan showed up early in a recurring role toward the end of season 10. In 1980, ABC's Three's Company was one of the most successful sitcoms on television. The story about two women and one man living together as roommates in a Santa Monica apartment was a hit. Suzanne Somers, who played the voluptuous and ditzy Chrissy Snow, thought a pay raise was in order. However, her efforts ended with her getting booted off the show. The Hollywood Reporter revisited the story of Summers firing in 2015, saying that Summers was getting paid $30,000 per episode, while co-star John Ritter was bringing home $150,000. When Summers asked for more, ABC offered her a bump of $5,000 per episode, but the actress stood her ground and demanded the same amount Ritter was receiving. After ABC refused Summers' demand, the actress missed the tapings for season 5's third and fourth episodes and was soon fired. Fired. Before this happened, Summer's manager and husband, Alan Hamill, was allegedly warned. Earlier that year, ABC had bowed to pressure and given raises to Penny Marshall and Cindy Williams, who at the time were the leads of Laverne and Shirley. Hamill said a friend with connections at ABC called and told him that ABC made an example of Summers to end talk of any more big paydays to leading women. When Marvel fans first met James Rhodey Rhodes, who would later become the Avenger known as War Machine, it was Terrence Howard playing the character. But in 2010's Iron Man 2, it was Don Cheadle in the role, and Cheadle would continue to play Rhodey for the rest of the character's appearances in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Howard wasn't happy with his ousting from the MCU, and for a while, he was pretty brazen about letting people know about it. In 2013, on Watch What Happens Live, Howard told Andy Cohen that when it came time to make Iron Man 2, Marvel only wanted to pay him one-eighth of what they owed him. He also added that when he reached out to co-star Robert Downey Jr. for help, he was ghosted. Two years later, Howard told Rolling Stone that he'd volunteered to take a $1 million pay cut to get Downey cast as Tony Stark in 2008's Iron Man. However, Marvel disagreed with Howard's story. In 2017, Howard returned to watch What Happens Live and said he and Downey were friends once more. He also claimed he was drunk when he'd appeared on the show in 2013 and blamed his inebriation for what he'd said. He stopped short, however, of saying his initial version of events was false. The first role that made critics take real notice of Robert Duvall was that of Tom Hagen. He was the shrewd but overcautious consigliere of the Corleone crime family in 1972's The Godfather. Duvall earned his first Academy Award nomination for his work in the film, and he reprised the role in 1974's The Godfather Part II. But while Hagen survives the events of the first sequel, he's nowhere to be found in 1990's The Godfather Part III. Instead, we learn Hagen has passed away in the years between the two stories. 
Speaking to Charlie Rose in 2004, Duvall said he left Tom Hagen behind not only because he wasn't offered enough money, but because someone else got way too much. Duvall told Rose, I said I would work easily if they paid Al Pacino twice what they paid me. That's fine, but not three or four times, which is what they did. In 2010, Duvall told Reuters he had no regrets about not appearing in the film, since, as many critics and fans have agreed, it wasn't as good as the first two. When NBC's political drama The West Wing premiered in 1999, it was looking like Rob Lowe's Sam Seaborn would be a main character. But over the course of three seasons, Seaborn's role on the show diminished. Finally, a season four storyline was written to facilitate his departure, though he returned in a recurring role in the show's final season. According to CBR, Rob Lowe's departure from The West Wing wasn't just because he had trouble getting the show to pay him more money. Instead, it was because he was the only lead actor in the series who couldn't get more money. While many of Lowe's co-stars had their salaries doubled since the beginning of the series, his had reportedly remained the same. For example, while CNN put Lowe's compensation at $75,000 per episode, Martin Sheen was receiving $300,000 per episode. In an official statement Lowe released in July 2002, he said that he was grateful to have been a part of the series. However, it had been increasingly clear for a while that there was no longer a place for Sam Seaborn on the West Wing. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.